I thought maybe this year I'll go to the lives of some of our heroes, some of the Baha'is who stood up alone at their time and faced a whole world, a whole family, and a whole world of non-believers, non-Baha'is. How they did how they did it? Who were they? You know, this heroic age, I'm not talking about epoch, just heroic age. The heroic age is just full of these heroes of our face. We know we are more familiar with the ones that the beloved guardian mentions in God Passes By and in the Nabil's narrative, these wonderful human beings who were courageous, who were saintly, who were heroic, who went forward, and they gave their lives. And Shoghi Effendi told us that they are our spiritual ancestors. It's all of us, not just the Persians. The spiritual ancestors of the Baha'is in the East and the West. Now, apart from them, we also have spiritual ancestors right here in this continent of Europe that you live in. I want to talk tonight about one of these heroic human beings and the life that she led and what made her what she became. You know, the, <coughs> the divine plans of Abdul Baha, 16 tablets of Abdul Baha addressed, 14 of it to the United States and two to Canada, have something in common, all of them, which is so wonderful. We read prayers about teaching. Most of these prayers that is revealed by Abdul Baha about teaching comes at the end of each one of these tablets. And the one I love very much, part of it, I'm just going to read to you. How can I succeed unless thou assist me to triumph by the host of thy confirmation, which alone can change a gnat into an eagle? a drop of water into rivers and seas and an atom into lights and suns. We have this example of atoms and drops and gnats in several prayers of Abu Baha. In another word, he is telling us, assuring us that a gnat can become an eagle, a drop can become an ocean. And we have the example of these drops in our own history. And one of the examples was May Maxwell. May Maxwell was the mother of Amatur Baharu Khan. But I don't think it is really very fair to introduce her just as the mother of Amatur Baharu Khan, because she was herself a person, a that was outstanding beyond measures. Ruhi Khanum often spoke about this. She said, Shoghi Effendi told her, one of the reasons I chose you to be my wife was because you are the daughter of May Maxwell. This was the station of May Maxwell. Now, to look at her life, who was she? Where was she? Was she something brilliant from the birth and brilliant in her education and brilliant in her services to humanity? No. She was a very ordinary person. She was born in a middle class, upper middle class in New York, in New Jersey. The family were well enough, well to do. The grandfather was a banker, so was very well to do, but he His bank was uh, burglarized and he lost everything and the whole family 
lost the money and they live middle class people. She was born in the heroic age. She was born in the year 1870. It was a period that women really were always the last to get any special attention in the family. They were two children. She was the older. The brother was the younger. So every bit of money and encouragement in the family went to the education of the brother. And the interesting thing is that the girl, the sister, was so proud of her brother. She prided herself with her, his achievements. It, it was not soured her or anything like that. She was a kind of a dreamer as a child. She had all kinds of visions and dreams and she wrote poetry and she was a very sensitive, sweet young girl. When she was six years old, her mother took the two children and the grandmother. The grandfather had just died. So the grandmother, the mother, and these two young children, four and six, they came to Paris. So her first language that she learned really in school was French, and she spoke beautiful French. But as I say, she was always in the background. When she was 14, 15, she went to England. She had a very dear cousin, her, that her mother was the sister of her own mother, aunt, and this mother had just died. And so the father of this girl invited me to go and be with her daughter because her daughter was heartbroken. And this was her first touch with British Isles. She stayed there one year. And she had many wonderful experiences. As I say, she used to dream and have visions and so on. And then she returned and they went back to the United States. And later on, again, they came to France when her brother was studying architecture. Now, during this period, something happened to me. When she was about 19, 20, nobody knows. She was struck by some kind of... Um, illness that Abdul Baha later on said to one of the believers that May Bowles was struck by a disease that no one knew the cause of it. Had she not found the face, she would have died of it. It was a mixture of physical, nervous kind of illness combined with a spiritual, spiritual quest. During this period between her 20 until 30, she had this deep, deep desire and the feeling that the truth has come to the world. She must find it. And she would, as much as she was able, she would study everything. At one time, she wanted to become a nun, and she studied Catholicism, and then she discovered that it did not satisfy her. She went to theosophy and she went to all kinds of... You see, this was a period of many, many people in the world were in this quest of finding the truth. The return of Christ was something in the air. They were all waiting for it. And she was one of them. So, as the result of not finding, she became very ill. And for one year, she was in bed in such a state that she could not walk, she could not do much. And it was at this period that the first group of the Baha'is came to Paris. Mrs. Hurst, who was the mother of the millionaire and the wife of another millionaire, and uh, she had heard the name of, the, of Abdul Baha and about the faith, and she was going on a cruise with her own family, she decided to include Akka in her program and go and see Abdul Baha. And she was a very close friend of the mother of May Maxwell. And so in Paris, the, she came to the home of the Bowles, and when she heard that this daughter, young daughter, was very ill, she said, I have in my, 
company, a doctor, a very good doctor. I send my doctor to see your daughter. Three years. And when she went and saw me, when he saw me, he said to her, you know, I cannot do much for you, but I think my wife can. And it was Lua Getzinger who told me about Abdul Baha. And it's very fascinating to know how. She didn't talk about anything, you know, except she said, you know, your answer is in the hand of a prisoner who holds the key to peace. And May had no idea who this prisoner was, key to what peace, when when she heard this, she said, I believe, I believe, and she painted. And that's how she accepted the faith, without knowing anything else. Slowly, Lua Getzinger, as much as she knew, she gave her, and then, because she wanted to see Abdul Baha, Mrs. Hertz invited her to be in her party and took her to Abdul Baha. Now, the story of her pilgrimage is really the story of her transformation. You know, when Abu Baha said in this prayer that a gnat can become an eagle, I think with some human beings, it's a slow process. You gradually come out of being a mosquito and you become maybe a little bird and eventually you become an eagle. With some believers, it was an instantaneous change in their lives. It was instantly they were transformed. And May Maxwell was one of them. She went to Haifa. She met Abu Baha. Without knowing very much, she just gave her heart and her soul to Abu Baha for the rest of her life. And it's very interesting. When she came back from the pilgrimage, her mother was not a believer. She was a very worldly, she was a very wonderful woman, very open-minded, and, but very worldly woman. Abdul Baha wrote this tablet to the mother of uh, May Maxwell. He said, <coughs> this is in 1902. He said, thy Lord shall strengthen thee in a ma- in, this is, excuse me, this is to uh, May herself. Said, Thy Lord shall strengthen thee in a matter whereby the queens of the world will envy thy happy state throughout all times and ages, because verily the love of God is as a glorious crown upon thy head the brilliant jewels of which are glittering force unto all horizons. Its brilliancy, transparency, and effulgence shall appear in future centuries when the signs of God will be spread and the word of God will encompass the heart of all the people of the world. I want to find the one to the mother because it's really very interesting. Because to her, he said that your daughter came. She was a mundane and she became heavenly. She was of this world. Now she is of the next. She is of the world of kingdom. You see this instant transformation. She was just a human being when, and she came back home something else. She came back from her pilgrimage. Her pilgrimage is, you, you should read this story because she has written it herself in a small booklet called Early Pilgrimage. And it is so heartwarming when you read her, how she gave her heart to Abu Baha, what happened during this pilgrimage. For example, she speaks of uh, one thing very fascinating. She said, one night I was upset and I told Lua, one of the pilgrims that was with them, she was not very happy with him. So she spoke about something this person had done, which was not very kind. But she just 
expressed her feeling about it. Abdul Baha arrived very soon after that. He called Lua. Now Abdul Baha wasn't in the room. Nobody had gone to report it to him. He called Lua and he said, I am unhappy because somebody tonight spoke unkindly about another person. This was told in private to Lua. At dinner time, May was sitting in front of Abu Baha and she felt that there was something Abu Baha looked at her not with very happy eyes. And she didn't know what she has done, but she knew Abu Baha was not happy and she burst into tears. And all through dinner she cried. Nobody paid any attention to her, including Abu Baha. She cried and at the end Abu Baha looked and smiled at her and encouraged her and it was finished. And she came out and in her life, according to the testimony of her daughter Ruhi Khanum, she said, I never heard my mother ever speak unkindly about anybody. If she had anything to say to somebody, she was straightforward, she was very frank. If they had done something wrong, he would tell them in person. And the way she said it, people took it from her and it was fine. But this was this, this method of transforming this woman. She went back, this pilgrimage was in 1898-99. Abu Baha gave her really a, a mission in France. And when I say that May was the spiritual ancestor of Europe, is because it's very interesting how through this little group and the very core of it, this May Bowls, the cause of Baha'u'llah within one year went to France, they went to England through Thomas Brakewell, it went to Italy through Juliet Thompson, who had just come to go and study painting and heard from somebody that there is this young woman in Paris who knows something about a new religion and she was besides herself and came all the way to Paris to see May Max May Bowles and she became a believer. And this from this little group, this cause of Baha'u'llah in a mysterious way went out in Europe. So to me, she is your spiritual ancestor, a personalized spiritual ancestor. She here she was all alone in Paris. Her mother was, she had an open heart, a house, and she allowed her to invite people. There was daily uh, teaching work going on. At this time, Abu Baha sent Mirza Abu Faz, who was the greatest scholar of the faith, to Paris with a translator to train these new Baha'is. So May's mother was very fond of Mirza Abu Faz, and so he was coming. Now, the time has come the <laughs> that Abu Baha suddenly sent the cable to May Maxwell, May Bowles, telling her, don't leave Paris. The mother was very surprised. She had written herself a letter to Abu Baha to say that now this is the last year that we have been in Paris for, I don't know, eight years, ten years. Now we are going back to America and I want to take my children on vacation to the seaside, so please uh, know that we are going. And what did Abu Baha do? He sent the cable not to the mother, but to the daughter and said, don't leave Paris under any circumstances. The mother was absolutely besides herself. She said, who is, what is happening? Who is this man, oriental man, in a Turkish prison who is telling my daughter what to do? Who is interfering with the plans of our lives? She was so upset that she went to Mirza Abul Fazl and 
told this and said, do something. I, I don't like, you know, what I see. Mirza Abul Fazl, just to calm the lady down, wrote a letter to Abul Baha and told him, this is the situation. And Abul Baha sent another cable, which is really, it's unbelievable. In this cable, Abul Baha said, all right, if she wants to go, she can go for one day. <laughs> so the day came when the mother and the brother were leaving for their vacation and May refused to go. And she, in this little booklet, she descri- no, not in that booklet, in, in, in an article she has written, she describes her sorrow when she took her mother and her brother to the train station and she said, I stood and I saw these two faces which were dearest to my heart, that all through my life they have been my friends and my mentor. I saw how sad and grieved my mother was, how angry she was, and I saw my brother, there was no feeling of, of love in his face they left and she was all alone and her mother had locked their apartment said I'm going away go to your friends your Baha'i friends I'm sure they'll help you that night she talks in this story that she has written she said that night I went to a small pension I took a room and I cried the whole night and I prayed that God may give me strength. And the next day she went to their regular weekly meeting at the home of Mrs. Jackson and Mrs. Jackson heard the story, said, come, I have a small apartment in my house, you come and stay with us. So she moved to the home of Mrs. Jackson. She doesn't know why Abdul Baha asked her to stay. This is, this is the, the measure of her face. She has no idea why is it that Abdul Baha is doing this to her. So she went and stayed there for a whole month, waiting. She knew something must be happening. During this month, two things happened, which were significant. One was that one day, one of the Baha'is, you see most of these new Baha'is, within one and a half years, Paris had about 30 Baha'is. It's a very fabulous thing. I wish Paris would do again something like that. Within one and a half years from this one woman, they became a community of 30 people. Most of them were Americans. Americans who were studying in Paris or doing special things. So they had regular meetings in the home of Mrs. Jackson. And so the next day she went to this meeting and she stayed there. And every day people would come, inquirers would come. And one of the new Baha'is was Edith Sanderson. And a close, she was very close friend with this French man. Hippolyte. And one day Hippolyte came to the house of me and he said, look, I have no religion. I don't believe in God. But I want to know what have you told Edith? You have changed her completely. She was a woman who was always very sad and always looking at the dark side of life. And since she has come to you and since she has adopted this new religion, she's changed. She's very happy. She's very hopeful. What did you tell her? Tell me. So May told the story of the face and who Abdul Baha was. Hippolyte Dreyfus was a scientist and he was an agnostic. And he listened and he said, well, good ideas, but I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it's this. And as he was leaving, he said, can I come again? So May gave whatever she had in writing in those days, were very little, gave it to him and he went. Ten days later, he came back. And he came back and he came back. And he became the first 
French Baha'i. But this wasn't what Abu Baha wished for May to stay. It was towards the end of the month when one day this American woman that she had met before, she had no interest in the face or anything, came to her house, knocked at her door, and she opened, and with her was this young man, and she describes the beauty of this young man, very slim, very delicate features, very thoughtful, and this American friend, she invited them in, and the American friend said to her that, you know, we came from the United States on the same boat, and this young man has ideas that I told him you can, you, you are interested in. He is, I don't know, a theosophist or something, and I have brought here for him to talk with you. May describes the features of this young man who was Thomas Breakwell. He says, as I looked at him, I saw that there was a veil in front of his eyes. I didn't know what this veil was. But he had, he had he, there was a thirst in him. So she invited them in and she spoke. She said they stayed for some time and she never mentioned the faith. She never mentioned Abu Baha. They spoke about spiritual matters, about theosophy, about everything. And she said she felt that the eyes of Thomas Breakwell was constantly on her, as if she, he was trying to go into her soul, into her heart. But he never asked anything. And when he was leaving, all he said to me was, may I come again? She said, yes, of course. And he left. And the next morning, very early, early in the morning, there was a knock at her door. Mrs. Maxwell was an early riser. She was up. Ruhi Khanum used to say she had heard from Abu Baha a word on her pilgrimage that stayed with her all through her life. Abdul Baha had told her something like this, that the spiritual sustenance is given to man at the hour of dawn. So there she was. Every dawn she was up to receive her spiritual sustenance. So it was at one of these dawns that morning when there was a knock at the door and when she opened it was Thomas Breakwell standing outside her door. Said the moment I looked at him I saw that the veil had been removed. Something had happened to him. He was disheveled. He came in. He said, I have not slept. I have walked all night. He said, when I left you, I decided to walk. Now, the day before when she had come, she had told me all her plan, his plans. He said, I have come to Europe. I want to be in Europe for two, three months. I want to travel. I want to see Europe. And I'll go back to my work in the United States. Now, this morning he came and he said, tell me, what is it? And May said, what are you asking? He said, when I was walking said, yesterday, when I left you last night, I walked in Champs-Élysées. It was calm. There was nothing moving. It was quiet. <coughs> and suddenly there was a gale. And in this wind and gale, I heard a voice. And the voice said, Christ has returned. And repeated it three times. He said, tell me, have, have I, am, am I insane? Have I lost my mind? And May said, no, you have just regained it. You have just found it. And then she told him about the face, about Abu Baha, about... And this man, this young man, was another instantaneous transformation. 
He completely changed all his plans. He had no desire anymore to travel in Europe to see any sights. He did not want to go anywhere. All he wanted to do was to go to Akka and to see Abdul Baha. And then the story of this young man is another one. But what happened to me, it is very fascinating. That day after Thomas Brakewell left her, she was so refreshed by this, she decided to go to the apartment of her the, my mother's apartment, which was locked up, but the mail she was collecting, she went to collect the mail. This is now the same day. She went to collect the mail from the concierge there, and there was a cable from Abu. She opened the cable. All it says, you may leave Paris now. It is really one of the greatest mysteries that we have in the history of our faith. That day, she was so overjoyed. She went back to, gathered her things, and by next morning she was on a train, and she went to her mother. And it's very interesting what happened to the mother. When she arrived, she told her mother the whole story of the whole month until it reached the end of it and the cable of Abu Baha that she showed her mother. And the, her mother burst into tears. And she said, you truly have the wisest master in the world. You have a wonderful master. And from that day, this mother became really a devotee of Abu Baha. She was not a believer for many years, and she became a believer before her death, when she was very ill, and that the only thing that her daughter could do for her, because in those days, people who had cancers, there was no way of reducing the pain, and she was in great pain, and she would ask her daughter to come and pray for her. And May would put her hand over her bleeding chest and pray, and it would calm her down. And she died as a believer. But this story of beginning of the life of May was such a wonderful thing. This young woman was completely transferred. Now, another crisis of her life, again in Paris during this last year, was when she met her future husband, who was a young man who had come to study, was a friend of her, her brother, and she was very attracted to him. But she had made up her mind that Abu Baha had told her that she should stay in Paris and serve the cause, so she's not going to marry, she's not going to do anything. Eventually, her mother wrote a letter to Abu Baha. She said, well, I don't want to interfere, but I want you to know what is happening to my daughter. <laughs> she has this very fine young man, but she's not going to marry unless you, you tell her to, because she won't. And Abu Baha sent a message to May and said that she should marry and go to Canada with her husband. And that's how, in 1902, she left Paris, and then she went to Canada. Now, the second part of her life in Canada was really as brilliant and as uh, historic as what it was in Paris, because with her, she took this love of Abu Baha. And to the end of her life, this was the power within her. And Abu Baha said that whoever meets May Maxwell, she rec they receive from her the love of God. She had this, this talent of, of giving what was in her soul to other people. When she went to Canada, it was, everything was strange. You know, for a person who was a city person, or a very mundane person, very cultured person, and everything, Montreal of those days apparently was very provincial and they were from a small group community of Scottish 
Presbyterian, the family of Mr. Maxwell. They were not French Canadian. First of all, Ruhi Khanum said her mother told her that when she, their boat docked in St. Lawrence and people, the workers came to take their luggage down, she listened and listened and she turned to her husband and said, what language people in this country speak? She couldn't even recognize the French of the laborers, you know, at the dock. So everything was very strange for her. She wanted so much to reach the French Canadian from the moment she arrived. But there was a tremendous barrier between the English and the French. The French were the second class citizens, so to speak, in, in Montreal. And all her life she worked towards breaking this barrier to bringing in the French Canadians to make friends. And she was able to do the French, the first French Canadian who came to the face was through her. Now, she, her husband was not a Baha'i. This is another part of her life that I think it's a very good lesson for many of us. Her husband was not a Baha'i. He was a very wonderful, artistic uh, man. He was a first-class architecture. They had a very good firm in, in uh, Montreal. The family were prominent. The husband was adored his wife and would allow her to do anything she wanted, but he wasn't interested. He was interested in his own profession. And one of the stories of Mrs. Maxwell at this time, Hanum often used to tell to the young people because she felt it was a lesson for us. She said her mother told her that once she was alone sitting with her husband in the library and Mr. Maxwell said, you know, May, I love you. You will be all, the only woman in my life. I have no interest in anybody else. But you, you are, all your mind and attention is centered on your religion. And I have my own profession. We are drifting apart. And Mrs. Maxwell was very upset. And she loved this husband of hers. She did not want to lose him. And she thought a little bit. And then she said, look, before I married you, I told you that first thing in my life will always be my face. After my face, you come. But the first thing and the most important is my face. I told you from the very beginning. Now, if you cannot go with me on this way, I have to go alone. And after a little while, Mr. Maxwell took her hand and he said, I will go all the way with you. And she always felt <clears throat> that that moment of strength in her life was the cause of making her husband a Baha'i. It's a very interesting thing. She did not weaken, she did not barter her face for her marriage, so to speak. And that their life was a very united, very happy, very loving couple to the very end. But Mr. Maxwell was just the opposite of his wife. You know, she was always thinking of the face, of teaching the face, going, having meetings, and this and Mr. Maxwell was busy with his own life. Until in 909, in 1909, they went on pilgrimage to see Abdul Baha. And one night at the dinner table, Mr. Maxwell said, Abdul Baha, I have a question. He said, yes. He said, my wife worships God through you. The Christians worship God through Jesus. But I worship God directly. Isn't that the right way, <laughs> so to speak? And Abdul Baha said, where is God? And he gave this typical answer we always give, God, God is everywhere. 
And Abdul Baha said, everywhere is nowhere. This is a philosophical answer. Everywhere is nowhere. A place is just one point you put your finger on. When you say everywhere, you are worshipping God through your own imagination. Then he said, a savage who worships God in a tree or in a stone is closer to God than a person who says, I worship God directly because he is worshipping his own imagination. While the fellow who is worshipping a tree, at least the tree is created by God. There is a connection there. And this very, very logical answer of Abu Baha changed Mr. Maxwell. And Hanum always said that her mother believed that the confirmation that came to him was at that dinner table. Then Mr. Maxwell, even to the end of his life, was a very quiet man. Ruhi Hanum used to say, I always considered my mother a saint and my father a very good man. <laughs> he said, when they died, Shoghi Effendi called Mr. Maxwell a saint and the mother a martyr. So Hanum said, I really recognized and saw the values and the personalities of my par parents through the eyes of Shoghi Effendi. He recognized that heroism of a martyr in Mrs. Maxwell, and he recognized the beauty of a saint in Mr. Maxwell. Now, in that pilgrimage of 1909, something very uh, important and, you might say, drastic happened in the family of the Maxwells. One day, Mrs. Maxwell was holding one of the babies, one of the grandchildren of Abdul Baha, the mother uh, was there. And Abdul Baha came out and saw her and looked at her and he said, You like to have a child, don't you? And Mrs. Maxwell said, Oh, I love to have a child, Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha said, If you, I will pray for you if you promise that nothing will come between you and the service to the cause. And Mrs. Maxwell said, Master, you know that nothing will ever come between me and service to this cause. No child, no husband, nothing. And Abu Baha promised her that he would pray for her in the shrine of Baha'u'llah that God may give her a child, if it is his will. And Ruhi Khanum was born a year later. And that in her upbringing of this child, she never forgot the promise that she had given to Abdul Baha, that the cause was always first in her life, and it remained first to the end of her life. And she brought up this child with this concept that Baha'u'llah is first, is the priority in life. Everything else will come after him and around him. And this was the education that she gave to her daughter. And the end of her life is really a brilliant part of her life. When this only beloved child of hers became the wife of Shoghi Effendi, it was so much for her. She could not believe that, you know, that she has given this daughter to the guardian of the face that's in such a sublime position. And this was all the time in her, what can I do for Shoghi Effendi to express my gratitude for this honor that he has bestowed on me? And it was the time, I said I won't talk about epochs, but it was the time of the first seven-year plan that Shoghi Effendi wanted the American Baha'is to leave their homes and pioneer and travel to South America. So she had it in, heart, in her heart that she must do this 
as an act of her gratitude to the cause. She was 70 years old. She had very weak heart. The doctors had told and she was all her life she was an invalid. She asked if she could go to South America and Shoghi Effendi wrote and said it's, it's meritorious but you have to have the permission of your doctor and the consent of your husband. Don't do it without his consent. This is very interesting. This is a woman who would have who would do anything for the face, not with the consent of the husband at all. But here Shoghi Effendi said, you can go only if your doctor allows you to go and if your husband consent to your travel. And it took poor Mr. Maxwell many months before he could say yes. He loved his wife. He knew how weak she was. He did not want her to go alone. He could not leave his business to go with her. And it took her many months. And eventually when a niece of Mrs. Maxwell offered to go with her, that Mr. Maxwell accepted to allow her to go on that trip and she was besides herself. The letters that she wrote after she knew that she could go on that trip are so beautiful. To all her friends she wrote the letter that now she's going to go to South America. Until then she had sent many people on their mission to teaching and pioneering. She both Materially, she helped them, and she encouraged them. But now her own turn had come, and she prepared, and she went on that trip. And as you know, she, was, she arrived in Argentina, and a day after she arrived, she died of a heart attack. And that's why Shoghi Effendi called her a martyr. She was the first American martyr, Canadian martyr, in the continent of Americas until then. She was a very, very wonderful human being. Shoghi Effendi said that her grave in Argentina is going to be a point of spreading the cause all over that continent. She was one of these brilliant, brilliant drops of water who became an ocean. I have several of those, and I think my time is now is finished. So for today, May Maxwell would suffice. Thank you. stories that I have collected slowly, slowly, they have a purpose behind them. It is not just stories. I'm trying very hard to tell you about lives that are so different from one another. These are not all the same. People that I'm talking about, they are the two ends of the, of the whatever. My English is gone too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when you are talking so much about unity, this is another part to remember, that they have been in the history of our cause, men and women, who championed the cause of Baha'u'llah. They became heroes in this cause. And they were so different from one another. And sometimes I think if we put all of them in one community, boy oh boy, we will have quite a clash because they were such strong individuals with their own opinions and personalities. They were not wishy-washy people. 
Ruhi Khanum used to say often, whenever she came across such problems of disunity in her trips, she had one word, one sentence that she would repeat. She used to say, this cause of Baha'u'llah is so big, is so great. It can take all kinds of people in it, all kinds of characteristics and people can come within this cause and be allowed to serve their own ways. We have Baha'is, thank God, the majority, who are able to work together, to consult together, and to plan together. But we also have Baha'is who are such individuals that they cannot work with anybody else. They are loners. And in our lives, Ali and I have seen some of these wonderful people, and we saw how, for example, Shoghi Effendi treated them, would pick one of these people and give that person something to do, a special service, and would leave them alone, let them do it, because he knew that they can do their best if they are alone. They take the order from him and they they do it. So I'm saying this so that we can remember these stories we are telling and hearing about. They are very different people. I spoke yesterday about Mabel's Maxwell. Now, she was a person, an embodiment of love, of nurturing, of mothering. This was her personality. She She was so full of love that no one could come across her in life and not receive some of that love. It was just like a fountain pouring out of her. And she was forbearance, she was forgiving. This was her nature. This was one personality. Then today I'm going to tell you the story of another woman. And it's so wonderful that so many of these heroes of our faith particularly in the West, they were women. This woman was extraordinary. The reason why I picked her up today to speak about it was especially because of this beautiful video, first thing in the morning, when our Romanian friends showed of Queen Mary of Romania and her uh, statements about the face. This is Marcia Ruth. We have heard Marcia Ruth all our lives. We have heard of her services. We have been proud of her. Shoghi Effendi spoke of her as the star servant of the cause, the star teacher in the cause of Baha'u'llah. In Persian, he said that she was the pride of all men and women in the Baha'i world. She was an extraordinary woman. But who was she? What kind of a personality was she? How did she start it? What family she was born in? What environment she grew up? And I want to say a little bit about it because in detail you can read the book that had been written about her and about her life, which is in detail and it's very beautiful. But I want to just go a little bit into her personal life and speak about this woman who became the star teacher of our cause. First of all, I go on with my stories according to Ali's uh, presentations every day. Still, we are in the period of the divine plans of Abu baha We have not come yet to the 10-year crusade. I have many exciting stories of that time because I was myself part of it, so I was a witness, an onlooker. I can tell you more later, but these are the stories of the period of the divine plans of Abu baha Abu baha at the end of one of these tablets said something which for the last almost eight years, have been the cause of movement, of of heroic efforts and acts 
from Baha'is, from East and West, from Africa and from Asia and from all over the world. It's a small sentence. And it's a plea. It is like a cry of the heart of Abu Baha at the age he was, old and broken physically. He said, oh, that I could travel even though on foot and in the utmost poverty to those regions and raising the call of Ya Baha'u'llah Baha in cities, villages, mountains, deserts, and oceans. Promote the divine teaching. This, alas, I cannot do. How intensely I deplore it. Please, God, ye may achieve it. How many Baha'is that we know that who left their homes and went into the jungles and the deserts for this one word of Abdul Baha. They tried to do what he wanted to do and he couldn't do at the end of his life. When these divine uh, tablets of Abdul Baha reached the Baha'is in America, thank God that they were few believers who arose instantly and in the lifetime of Abdul Baha moved out of their homes and they did travels and pioneerings. One of them was Marsarut. Now Marsarut was born in a home, in a family of very, very devout, devoted Christians. Her father was a canon in the uh, Baptist Church, and you know the Baptist Church in the United States is a pretty fanatical sect of Christianity. She was brought up in that atmosphere, in that home. She was a very uh, intelligent, individualistic person, and thank God she was in America, so as a woman she was able to go to college and to study and to have a good education. She became a teacher. She was in love with English language. And she became a principal in a school that was too closed in. She couldn't bear it. She came out and she took for some years to, to teach Shakespeare in the university. She loved that. That was also too much holding her down. So she became a journalist. And that gave her more freedom to see people. But it's very interesting to see what she did in, at the beginning of her journalism. It's very fascinating. When I read this, you know, you, we have only seen Marcia Ruth in her photograph at, towards the end of her life when she was a very a simple looking woman, not very beautiful. Uh, you know, you never thought that this woman in this picture once upon a time was a journalist who loved to report. She, was, she moved from her own hometown and she went to Pittsburgh that in those days was the place, the center of money and developments and everything. And it was the period, 1900, when the motor cars had just come out. So, she became a fast writer about the motorists and the motor cars and the latest models. And she would go from one party to another to meet these people who were motorists and their women who were dressed in Paris. They were very wealthy people. She really became a journalist of the social, social people, socialist people of her time. It was there that she met with a lot of missionaries. Because Pittsburgh was the center of money in that time, a lot of missionaries had come to Pittsburgh trying to get money out of the wealthy people for their missions in Africa and in South America and so on. So she moved also with the missionaries. One day in a cafe she was sitting with this group of missionaries and one of the missionaries expressed himself very loudly the fact that, after all, you know, uh, people uh, 
are not, unless they are Christian, they are heathens. You have to be Christian. And by Christian, he meant Presbyterian, mind you, not just any Christian. Unless you are a Presbyterian Christian, then you are a heathen. So this nobody, nobody else in the world is, is saved except that. Martha Ruth was a young woman and moving amongst them. She loudly expressed her own view that she couldn't believe that that was true, that she felt that other people, maybe if they had a belief that they had the right to salvation too. Now, it just happened that one of the Baha'is was sitting at another table. His name was Harry, um, what was his name? I forgot. Hmm? Roy Wilhelm, that's right. Roy Wilhelm. Now, Roy Wilhelm was one of the most wonderful Baha'is of America, and he heard this. So he thought this woman has something, you know, it's a good to reach her because she has expressed a view which was close to the face. So Roy came afterwards forward when this group got up to go, and he said, uh, excuse me, I, I couldn't help hearing your, what you said, but I want to tell you about Abdul Baha <laughs> and what Abdul Baha had said that humanity is one and this and that. He started expressing all the teachings and of course the missionaries were not interested. But Martha Ruth said, took her card out and gave it to Roy and he said, uh, she said, Send me some books. I'm busy now, but send me something to read. And you know, for a whole year, this dear man sent Mars Ruth books. There weren't many books, papers and pamphlets and anything about the faith, prayers. And Mars Ruth was so busy, she never had time to read this. So she would receive these things, and whenever she found somebody who was spiritually a bit attuned, she would give these things to them. <laughs> she never read, she didn't know what this man was talking about, but Roy Wilhelm never failed to see her whenever he was in Pittsburgh. And you know this perseverance of the teachers, it is something unbelievable. I sometimes think I put myself on the place of that man, and and she was very open with him. When he would say, did you read it? She would say, no, I haven't had time yet, but I will one day. I would have probably given up. I said, well, this woman isn't interested. But not Roy Wilhelm. He would just continue. Send pamphlets and send papers and send books. And try to see Mars Ruth. And eventually, Mars Ruth in Chicago was probably cornered <laughs> somewhere. And the first American Baha'i, Thornton Chase, told her about the faith, and she in, became a believer. Now, her life completely changed. One of the first things she did, she wrote a paper, a, an article in the paper about the Bab and the Baha'i teachings in her own hometown where her father was a very well-known, the family were very well-known and loved, she was very badly persecuted. She was, they wrote against her, they stood up in the church and spoke against her, and she was really persecuted in her own hometown. Her own parents were very wonderful people, the father and the mother. They, they never became believers, but they were with her. Now, in 1915, she decided that she wanted, she had something in her that was, I love more than anything else in Martha Ruth. She had that spirit of adventure in her. She could not be put down. She was a person who wanted to go and see for herself the world and the people of the world. In 1915, in earlier on, she made a trip to South America, but in 1915, she decided to go and see Abdul Baha for herself. She reached Egypt. It was in the middle of the war. It was not possible for an American to get into Palestine. 
And so she went on to India and to Burma and to China and one of her long trips. And then she went back home. Now she started, Abdul Baha started, the tablets of Abdul Baha to her began from the very beginning that she had become a Baha'i. Pouring encouragement to her, encouraging, encouraging her to travel, encouraging her to, to teach. But she was by nature a traveler. She came back from that trip and she was tied down to her parents' home for a period of time because her mother died and she felt she had to take care of her father and she stayed on with the father. But in between, whenever she would find a little time, off she would go on a trip. Now, when the divine uh, tablets of Abu Baha came, she was one of the first one who was hit by these divine tablets. And she decided that she has to go to South America for Abdul Baha. And she was the first American who left the shores of the United States and went down all over South America and traveled. And wherever she went, because she was a journalist, she was able to get in touch with newspapers, she was able to write articles, she was able to teach the faith in that way. Now, <coughs> she came back, Abdul Baha passed away. She was never able to, have, to go and see Abdul Baha, and it was a very great sorrow in her life because she tried in 1915 and she wasn't able to see him and afterwards she was not able to go and when by the time she was ready to go, Abdul Baha had passed away. The same year that Abdul Baha passed away, Martha Ruth's father died and then all the uh, obstacles, so to speak, from, was removed from her life. From then on, from 1921 onward, Martha Ruth never sat down. She just continuously traveled. She was very ill. Sometime when she, at this period she became very ill and she had a very severe uh, operation and whatever it was, it frightened her terribly of operation. So from then on, she was often ill, but she would not see a doctor because she was afraid that if she sees a doctor, the doctor will say something serious is the matter with her, and if there is something serious the matter with her, they are going to put her in hospital and she won't be troubled. She was in the days of Abdul Baha, when she went to South America, she was very ill. And one night she sat down and wrote a letter to Abdul Baha. And he said that well, he was so, she was so ill that she needed his help. And Abdul Baha wrote her and said that I have prayed for you. And Martha Ruth recovered and she believed that that prayer of Abdul Baha, that tablet of Abdul Baha was her healing. And all through her life, this tablet went with her everywhere and whenever she was very ill, that she would stay a little bit, she read the tablet, she was sure in her own heart that she would be all right. In one of her trips when she went to China and to Japan, she traveled with another wonderful hand of the cause of God, Agnes Alexander. And it is very adorable to see in the notes and the writings of Agnes and also to memoirs of Mars Ruth they were, again, two people so completely different in character and in their personality and in the way of their lives that was unbelievable. And then Martha Ruth writes in her own notes that how hard it was to put up, you know, with the slowness of Agnes. She was very fast. Agnes was very slow. She, was, she wasn't afraid of anything. Agnes was very careful of not to say anything to the Japanese to, you know, uh, uh, make them unhappy in their cultural ways. Martha Ruth didn't care about anybody's culture. She felt that she had something to say. All right, she will say it. And, you know, Japan, one can, I don't know if any of you have been to Japan, 
I have been to Japan only maybe 25 years ago, which is very modern Japan. But Japan of early 1902 and 3 and 4 was a Japan of such tradition that you could not walk without thinking of how you should take your first step and so on. I remember when we went, when Ruhi Hanum went on a tour of Japan, I was terrified because everywhere we entered, you had to take your shoes off first at the entrance to the house. Then when you went into the house, if you want, excuse me, to go to the bathroom, at the door of the bathroom, you changed again your, your shoes and went into the bathroom, came out, you put the other shoes on, you came out. When you went out, you put another. It was the, the, the shoes alone really terrified me. I remember <laughs> once we went to a private museum and uh, <laughs> in the middle of this, and there was a very important person who was showing the museum to Ruhi Khanum. And in the middle of it, she excused herself to go to the bathroom. I went with her, and she forgot to change the shoes. And you should have seen the silence, you know, in there, as if some great crime has taken place. Now, if this was the Japan of 1978, 79, you can imagine what it was in 1902 and 3. And with the free spirit of Mars Root, poor Agnes Alexander had a lot of trouble, you know, trying to hold her down. Nevertheless, they were two lovers of the cause, lovers of Abdul Baha. And they were able to work together, and they traveled all through Japan and all through China. She fell in love with China. That became her love and many, many times. Whenever she went to the east, she would tour the whole of China. Now, she came to visit, uh, after the war, she came to visit Shogi Effendi in 1923. It was her first pilgrimage. Now, Shogi Effendi was setting up the Baha'i Bureau in Geneva, and he needed someone to, to you know, hold it and to take care of it. So she, he thought Martha Ruth was the best person. She was very, a, very wonderful in meeting people and presenting the face, and he asked her to go and establish this Baha'i Bureau. Marcia Ruth went, she could not stay more than a few months. This was too much, tying her down to an office. That was not life of Marcia Ruth. She stayed there for a few months until she found somebody else to train them and give them, and off she went again. She traveled all over Europe. It was in this period of 1920s, from 25 onward, when she was able to reach Queen Marie, and this was really the crown of her life. And uh, the friendship, personal friendship that she established with the queen was another side of her life. That how, uh, how much she was loved and admired by that woman. In one of her travels, she became often ill. In one of the travels, she came to the Holy Land, Shogi Effendi called her and asked her to go to Iran because there was a great persecution and he wanted her to go and help. Maybe as a journalist, she could help the Baha'is. And that <coughs> four months that Marsa Ruth traveled throughout Iran was a very wonderful thing. The many, many Baha'is that met her, there are so many photographs in villages and in small towns that she took with Baha'is. But one important thing that Marsa Ruth did in Iran, which was unique, because nobody had been able to do it neither before nor since Marsa Ruth, and that was the contact, the close contact with the family of Tahiri. She went to Ghazvin. How did she manage to do that? This is, for me, is a mystery. I wish somebody would one day explain it. The family of Tahere are very, today, even today, they are very, very fanatical, fanatical people. They, all the terrible slanders that was really targeted, uh, Tahere was targeted to, and her name was targeted, 
was came from her own family. They were extremely fanatical enemies of the cause. And they never allowed the Baha'is to go near them, allowing them to go to the house, to meet the family, to get any information. And Marcia Ruth, an American woman, how she did it, I don't know. But she managed to go in Ghazvin to the home of the families of, of uh, Tahereh. And this beautiful book that she has written about Tahereh, a lot of the information comes firsthand that she got from the family. Now, when she was really tired and very ill, very often at this time she would receive these most beautiful cables of Shoghi Effendi, which Shoghi Effendi poured out. You know, if you read some of, I'm sure in the book you have noticed, some of the letters and, and cables of Shoghi Effendi, almost all of them, addresses her, this is very unusual, they are very few, addresses her as dearest Martha. It, he was concerned about her health, about her money situation, that she would, he would, she would never want to ask for help. But there was Shoghi Effendi, like a, as he called himself, a true brother, watching over Martha Ruth, every step she was taking pouring encouragement to her, announcing to the Baha'i world of the services that she was rendering. And it was so wonderful that Martha Ruth was able to give such joy to Shoghi Effendi. Any of you who have read this wonderful book of Ruhi Khanum, The Priceless Pearl, you will see that in this book how much Ruhi Khanum has given to show the relationship of Martha Ruth to Shoghi Effendi, the correspondence of Martha Ruth with Shoghi Effendi, because she was the cause of such joy to the heart of Shoghi Effendi. <coughs> Martha Ruth, as you know, died in Hawaii. On her last trip, she became very ill, and she died there of cancer. She suffered from this cancer for many, many years. The pain and the suffering that she had physically was the cause of it was this cancer that eventually in Hawaii killed her. Today her, <coughs> <coughs> today her grave is really a place of almost pilgrimage for anybody who goes through Honolulu. And it's a wonderful thing to be at that gravesite. Now, this is the general life of Martha Ruth. But then there are some little personal things that I had heard about Martha Ruth that I want to tell you. One of it was that Ruhi Khanum used to tell this story. She said she was 16 years old, and it was that time that so much praises of, show, of uh, Martha Ruth from the pen of Shoghi Effendi would come. And Ruhi Khanum said, you know, at the age of 15, 16, you are very self-conscious and self-centered. And she said, I, was, I adored my mother. And I thought that there is no one in the world like my mother. And she said, I was always, this was for me a question mark. Who is this Martha Ruth? She said, I knew her. I had seen her as a child. But who was she compared to my mother? Why is it that Shoghi Effendi speaks so much about her? So Martha Ruth came to Montreal. Ruhi Khanum was 16 years old. She said, first of all, I was very surprised to look at her because she was so kind of, dowdy, you know, she didn't have beautiful clothes, she didn't dress up well, she was very plain, and she said this for me, at the age of 16, I didn't think much. She arrived and she had written, she, they had arranged for her to come on, on a teaching trip, and uh, she had asked Mrs. Maxwell to arrange for her to see the director of the radio station in Montreal. 
And uh, so Mrs. Maxwell had gone. She was a very well-known woman. She had many friends. And she had gone to this man, and this fellow said, look, this is a Catholic country, and they will, I have instructions. Just, I cannot give you time to anybody to speak about Baha'i faith. She can come and speak about her travels, but she must not mention the name Baha'i. <clears throat> no matter what Mrs. Maxwell, how she tried to plead, the man said, I cannot do it. But she can come and she can talk about her trips. When Marcia Ruth arrived, Mrs. Maxwell told her that this is what has happened. She didn't say anything. The next morning they had an appointment to see this man, and Ruhi Khanum said she never forgot Marcia Ruth. She came down the steps, and she said in their home, I don't know, uh, you know the Maxwell home, which is now a shrine in Montreal. It's a very beautiful house, and it must have been very beautiful in the days that the Maxwells lived in it because Mr. Maxwell was an artist, was an <coughs> antique collector. He had beautiful things. Everything in that house was really essence of beauty. And Ruhi Khanum said always on their entrance <coughs> there was a mirror, and in front of the mirror they had flowers. And at that day they had a huge bowl full of tulips, and Hanum said that I was watching, you know, to see what is going to happen now. And she said, Marcia Ruth came down the steps. She had one look at this bunch of tulips. She took one tulip out in her hand with nothing around it. And Hanum said, Montreal was a very, very reserved community. People had ways, you know, flower, first of all. You didn't take it just like that in your hand. It had to be beautifully put in a paper and arranged. Martha Ruth took one and started going out of the door. She said they went together. The taxi came to take them, and Hanum said, I stood at the door, watched this woman with one flower in her hand, and she said, I thought to myself, there's something wrong there. You know? <laughs> And she said they went to the radio station. And when they came back, she said, my mother told me what happened. You know, when Ali was talking about purity of motive, this was the real essence of Marsaru. Her motive was almost 100% pure. Somehow, whatever she did, she had no personal interest in it. Mrs. Maxwell told the story that how she arrived in the room of this man, the, man, the director of the radio station in Montreal, a very important person. She walked straight to him with, his tul with her tulip in her hand and offered it to the man. Said so this man looked at her, his eyes filled with tears. He said, how did you know I am a Dutchman? She didn't know. She said, this is my national flower. How did you know that? Martha Ruth didn't know it. But what made her to do something like that, it was that she was that pure, pure channel that Baha'u'llah used. And she did things that was so wonderful. Another thing that Ruhi Khanum used to in... in, in uh, explaining, you know, talking about Marcia Ruth because she adored Marcia Ruth. And she used to say Marcia Ruth believed that this message of Baha'u'llah is the greatest treasure, the greatest jewel in the world. That she was going to see a queen or she was seeing a president or she was seeing somebody important Therefore, she must give them the most precious, the most valuable treasure that she has. And there is nothing more precious than the message of Baha'u'llah. She offered it like that. It was an honor for the receiver to receive something which was so precious and unequal. 
She used to say another thing about Marsaru that was again the same, came to the same thing, that she was so pure in her moti. You know, she used to give in her travels, wherever she went, she used to give public talks. Ruhi Khanum said she was in, she stayed in Montreal five days. And every night she had a public talk in different places. She said I, she had, Hanum had a friend who was a very intelligent, intellectual student in the university, and they were trying to teach him the face. And so they had spoken so much about Marsha Ruth, he decided to go and listen to her. And after all the five talks were over, he came to the home of the Maxwells, and he said, I cannot understand. He said, I went to these five talks of Mars Ruth because each of them were publicized with a different uh, title. You know, it wasn't all the same. But she said the same talk five times. She said, he said that I listened to her. There was everything she said, if I want to boil it down, I can say it in two sentences. But what was in that woman? What she said, it took you, it, it went into your heart, it went into your soul. She captivated her audience. What it was, was that love that she had in her heart and that she had put herself. She used to say, Ruhi Khanum said, so often she heard Marsha Ruth saying this sentence, step aside, let Baha'u'llah do it. Don't stand in the way of Baha'u'llah. Step aside, step aside and let Baha'u'llah do it. This was her motto, so to speak, in life. This was the wonderful, wonderful person that I thought we should hear of because you are living, all of you, in Europe, and there is another woman who is the pride of not only the continent of Europe, but the pride of the Baha'i world. She is a person that throughout this dispensation will always be known as the star teacher of our faith. We should follow her examples and try to be like her. I don't know if I can tell you another story or the time is finished. Yes? And another one, another such person, very different in personality, who also uh, rose in the lifetime of Abu Baha and became the cause of the joy of heart of Abu Baha and left United States, you know, after reading the divine plan, was called Leonora uh, Armstrong. She's not known as the way Marsha Ruth is known. But she was in her own right and in her own place a very, very great and wonderful human being. I had the privilege, I never saw Marsha Ruth, but I had the privilege of meeting Leonora Armstrong. She was a young woman from a very, very humble background and family. She had become Baha'i in New York through May Maxwell. And when these divine plans came, she was a teacher in school. She wanted so much to leave and go to South America and teach the faith. Her whole family said that how can everybody turn against it? A woman, a single young woman to go to South America is, is murder, is disaster. You cannot do it. So she came to May Maxwell in one of her trips that she was in New York, and she told her that this is what in my heart, I don't know what to do, my family say that, I am frightened. And May Maxwell was a, a mountain of encouragement, just poured her life on there and encouraged her, and she said, go, I wish I was free like you, I wish I had the use, I wish I had the time to do what you can do. You go, don't wait. And Leonora herself told me this story. She said, when I was leaving New York to go, May Maxwell took me to, she said she was a very, very, 
as I say, from a very humble background. She said she took me to the best, most expensive uh, department store in New York, and she bought me clothes like as if I was going on a marriage trip. Said she bought me all the silk underwear and a silk dress, like a bridal trousseau that she gave her. She said, you are going on this trip. I want you to go as a bride. And this wonderful young woman alone, she left and she went to Brazil. She has fantastic, she had wonderful stories of how she arrived and she didn't have much money and the only place she could rent at the beginning was a garage in the family, in a home of a big family. They rented her the garage. The weather was very hot. This was in El Salvador, Bahia, which is a very hot place. It was very hot. And she said, when I closed the door of the garage, I'd suffocate. And she said, if I open the door, and there were <laughs> bunches of flowers that young men would throw into her garage, you know, <laughs> trying to express their feelings towards her. <laughs> So she had a very, very rough time, but she settled, and she lived there, she married there, and she established the faith in Brazil. She was the person who opened this beautiful, big country of Brazil. And it was so wonderful. In 1996, in one of the last trips that Ruhi Hanum did, was the last time she went to South America, we went to Brazil because... They celebrated the 70 years after uh, she had gone, uh, Leonora had gone and opened the country to the cause of Baha'u'llah. And she, at the end, what she did, the service she did there was so wonderful. She opened a kind of an uh, orphanage and she took in her home, she trained, she had no children of her own, but she brought up and educated 18 children that from some of them babies that people would come and put outside her door and she would take in and she would bring them up. And then she had an orphanage that to this day still is running uh, by other people. But she was a very wonderful people. She was another one who was able to bring joy to Abu Baha in his whole lifetime. Because these divine plans of Abu Baha, very few responded in his lifetime. These were the few people who did. And another one, and that would be the last one for today, was Haid Dan, who was also with his dear wife in lifetime of Abu Baha was able to leave United States and go all the way to Australia and open Australia to the face. These were such unique and wonderful human beings that if we study their lives and read about their methods of teaching, this, uh, it, it is the greatest lesson for us how to follow. These are our role models. They are there for us to to follow their, in their footsteps. Thank you. You know, with all the propelling, we haven't reached the 10-year crusade. That's what I am waiting for. Everything until now all the stories I have told you are people that, with the exception of one, I have never met. I have read about them. I have read Shoghi Effendi's messages and cables about them, and I have heard a lot about them. And I'm really dying for tomorrow to come, where I can get to a field that I have personally known people, worked with people, and with my own eyes, I have seen this, these words, beautiful words of beloved guardian in action. So we have to wait until tomorrow.
Today I thought I'll speak to you about a very one of the wonderful, wonderful women who arose from the United States and her services is so great that when she passed away, the beloved guardian announced to the Baha'i world that because of her services that she has won the station of a hand of the cause and of a martyr, the two at the same time, is the only one who reached to this sublime point, and that was Keith Ransom Keller. You know, reading about Mrs. Keller was very interesting for me because she was, she and also Marcia Root, these are, were the two women, and there were others, but these two particularly, I had heard a lot from my very early childhood because they had come to Iran when I was alive. I don't remember them. I have some vague idea that I remember somebody like Keith Ransom Keller because I heard that in my parents' home there was a very big gathering. I have some kind of an idea that there was this lady there, very strange. She looked very different from all the women I had ever known. I think that was Keith Ransom Keller. I did not remember Martha Ruth at all. I was too young. But Keith Ransom Keller was a very fascinating woman. She came from the southern states of the United States. She was born in a very old kind of army family, very distinguished. They had social position. And as you probably uh, have read in many stories of the southerners in the United States of America, most of them very proud and very uh, considered themselves much higher than the rest of the country. She was from that background. She had very good education. She went to the Vassar, whatever they, Vassar uh, University, which was one of the top university for women in the world and in the United States. And uh, so she had all the, ad all the social advantages in their hand in her hand when she graduated and came out. And she married a man she loved very much and had a very happy life with him. And together they went to Paris and she studied some art. You know, she had everything that was considered the best at her time. Another thing that I love about Keith Ransom Keller was that she loved beautiful clothes. I wish I had the pictures of these women to show you, but this Keith Ransom Keller, if you see her photographs, she's really fascinating. You know, she traveled with 16 or 17 suitcases. She traveled all over the world, but she had in her travels, my daughter always complains that I go with too many. I go with one suitcase, she still complains, but Keith Ransom <laughs> Keller, traveled with 17 suitcases. Her diaries just explain her love of clothes because she speaks about very important occasions, but always she begins by describing what she wore. <laughs> she said, at this such and such a meeting, I wore my uh, mauve and purple outfit and I had my such and such a hat on and I wore such and such a jewelry. She loved clothes. And she was a very distinguished woman. She was very tall and slender. So you can imagine a woman like that, dressed so beautifully, she attracted so many people. She became a Baha'i in 1921. She never met Abdul Baha. She had she became a Baha'i really after the ascension of Abu Baha. But her service to the cause began very soon. In 1926, she came to the Holy Land and met Shoghi Effendi, and she fell in love with Shoghi Effendi. I want just to read what she wrote. It was at a time when 
the convention was on in Chicago in the United States, and she wrote a letter from the Holy Land to the Baha'is in the Wilmette. And it just pours out from her heart her love for Shoghi Effendi. She said, any one of us is ready to die for him. But can we conscientiously number ourselves among those who are willing to live for him? And that's what she did. From that moment that she met Shoghi Effendi, she really lived for Shoghi Effendi. And when she wrote this, and when she met Shoghi Effendi, she only, she, of course she did not know, she only had seven years of life ahead of her. And these seven years were spent in the propagation of the faith. She started traveling all over the United States, all over the Caribbean islands. Then she went to India and she went to China and she went to everywhere. They, you know, they, these women were quite something. I think one day we will have dramatic authors like Bahia, which I hope to write novels about these women. You know, they are such beautiful books. I am fascinated by whoever traveled, and I have read quite a lot of books about these women in last century and in the beginning of 19th century and end of 18th century when they got up and alone traveled in different parts of the world. If you read, they are fascinating human beings. I think one day we will have writers who will write this story about these women and their courage and what they did, you know, in their lives. She was traveling in India when Shoghi Effendi called him to uh, stop the travel and come immediately to the Holy Land. This was in 1930. She went to the Holy Land from India with the hope that she will go back and continue her trip and in Haifa Shoghi Effendi for three days, really it was an intensive course for Keith Ransom Keller about Iran, the condition of Iran, the situation of the Baha'is, the persecution of the Baha'is. It was at the time that the government had closed the Baha'i schools. And Shoghi Effendi trained Keith for three days and sent her off to Iran to go and try to have audience, if possible, with the king, if not with the ministers, and try to redeem you know, this right of the Baha'is. You, can you imagine in 19, maybe you can't, I can imagine, in 1931, 32, the lady with 17 suitcases <laughs> and her beautiful clothes arrive in Iran it is the time of Reza Shah, when just at the beginning when he is unveiling women in Iran, but women and the people in the country were still very shy to be in the public, and there was this beautiful American woman arrived. She traveled, first of all, all over the holy sites in Iran, and <clears throat> it's a very fascinating thing. One of the distinctions of Keith Ransom Keller was like many of women of her time. She was a very close friend and a devotee of May Bowles Maxwell. It's very interesting, the connection of all these women to each other. She wrote a series of letters from Iran to Mrs. Maxwell that <coughs> were all uh, private letters. Ruhi Khanum often said that mother, her mother shared everything with her except the private affairs of other people. But everything else in the face she would share with her was part of her education. She said she remembered that period that these letters of Keith would come from Iran. And she said, I remember my mother taking these letters into her bedroom she would lock the door, and she would read this, and she would sob. She would cry her heart out. And 
خانم said she never showed me these letters. And when I would ask her, she would say, these are too private. These are too confidential. I cannot speak with you. But that case is suffering. And what was she suffering from? Was their hope to get close to somebody, to do this service for the beloved guardian, and she could not. She met the minister. She went once to the office of the minister, and uh, he would not see her. Over and over again, this distinguished, wonderful woman would go and sit in these offices and they would not see her. And then eventually when the man saw her and gave promise and she thought that maybe something will will be done, she realized that it was all just words and they were not going to do anything. And another thing, when she arrived in Iran, she became very ill. Very soon she became very ill, which was not unusual. Many foreign people at that time coming to Iran, one of the first things would hit them was dysentery, and that they would be ill all through their trip. And Keith really suffered from illnesses in Iran. And that she would pour out her heart to this close friend of hers of the suffering she was going through. And yet... She loved the Baha'is. And in some of these letters, she also describes the Persian Baha'is, particularly in villages. Over and over, she said that of only my sisters and brothers from the West could come and see what is the meaning of faith, what is devotion. You have to come and see these people in Iran, in the villages, to understand what is the meaning of devotion to the cause. And heartbroken because she was not succeeded for what she had gone there, she went to on, on her way to go to Shiraz. She stopped in Esfahan. And of course, because Shoghi Effendi had sent a cable to the Baha'is of Iran and speaking of the uh, station of Keith Ransom Keller and his uh, trust in her, the Baha'is just received her with open arms and loved her and poured their love to her. And I tell you, the Persian love is, can be very strong, <laughs> can be overpowering. And this is really what killed her. Because she was in a meeting and a group of Baha'is had come from one of the villages and amongst them was a woman with a baby in her arm, very ill, And she brought this baby and put it in the arm of Keith for blessing. And then this child had uh, smallpox and Keith contracted smallpox and died of this terrible disease. And she is buried in Iran. And then Shoghi Effendi's cable came to the Baha'i world and calling her a martyr because she mar- she was really in the path of service to the cause when she gave her life. But the fascinating thing is that not only in the cable about Keith Shoghi Effendi spoke about her, but years later, another one of these fabulous women, Marion Jack, who also arose, she was of the same vintage, same period. Marion Jack was Canadian. Keith was American. Keith was very ladylike and very uh, uh, polished. Marion Jack was very open, very frank, very loud. Marion Jack became a believer in the days of Abu Baha and in her joy she wrote to Abu Baha and said, Let me come and serve you in the Holy Land. Abu Baha invited her to come to Akka. She stayed one year in the household of Abu Baha and her job was to teach the children and the daughters of Abu Baha English. One day Abu Baha came and found her with her children around her and she was really marching them. He looked at her and said, Hmm, General Jack in her army, in her camp. 
So she became known as General Jack. This General Jack is, was another lover of Abu Baha and of the cause. After a year, one year that she served in the master's house, she went back to Canada. And then again, there she was for years. She was back and forth in Montreal and nurtured and loved by May Maxwell, a very close friend of May Maxwell. Ruhi Khanum often said that one of her earliest memories of Marion Jack was when she was quite young. And she remembered what a strong arms she had when she would lift her up and hold her. She was afraid to be broken by her. She was so strong. Marion Jack came to Europe for the, during the seven-year plan. And she went to Bulgaria. But the story of the end of life of Marion Jack is very interesting. She was in Bulgaria during the war, and life was very difficult. Shoghi Effendi was very worried over her. And many Baha'is from different parts of Europe who knew Marion Jack wrote to Shoghi Effendi and say, take Jack, please advise Marion to come out of Bulgaria. She is in danger. And Shoghi Effendi sent the cable to Marion and asked her to come. She said that it is good for you to come. Come to Geneva and stay in Geneva until this problem, the war is over. And Marion, you know, being the general, Marion sent back a message to Shoghi Effendi and begged him to allow her to stay in her post. She said, I don't want to leave my post at no circumstances. Shoghi Effendi was proud of her. For years they lost complete touch with her. They didn't know if she's alive, if she was killed. Her home was bombed. She was living in a room in a schoolhouse. She had very, very hard life during the war years. But she remained in her post and she did not leave uh, Bulgaria. Ruhi Khanum used to say this story. I remember she told the friends in Sofia when she was there. She said after the war, an American came from uh, Europe. To, he had been to Bulgaria. And he came to Haifa. And uh, it was the first time that Shoghi Effendi had news of Maria, that she was alive, that she, everything was all right. She was in great need. And Ruhi Khanum said, I sent a letter to Marion and I asked her to tell me what she needed. And she said, with a mail later on came a letter from Marion. She had stood on a piece of paper and drawn the shape of her feet. She said, I have no shoes. Send me a pair of shoes. And Ruhi Khanum said, I went and it was after the war, and Haifa, even today, is not a place for shopping, but in those days, it must have been very difficult. And Ruhi Khanum said, I went and looked at every shoe shop in Haifa and in Tel Aviv to buy the strongest, the best shoes I could buy for Marion and send it to her. And when she died, this is the cable I want to read to you that Shoghi Effendi said to the Baha'i world. Because... It's a very interesting thing how Shoghi Effendi linked the lives of a number of Baha'is together in this cable. He said, <coughs> Mourn loss immortal, immortal heroine Marion Jack. Triumphant soul now gathered distinguished band co-workers Abha Kingdom. Now, it's really, you can imagine, Marion Jack has gone to Abha Kingdom and there is a feast. And who is in this feast? Mars Root, Lua Getzinger, May Maxwell, Hyde Dunn, Susan Moody, Keith Ransom Keller, Ella Bailey, Dorothy Baker. 
whose remains lying in such widely scattered areas glow as Honolulu, Cairo, Buenos Aires, Sydney, Tehran, Isfahan, Tripoli, depths of Mediterranean Sea. You know, you go back to these places. Honolulu is where Mars Root is buried. Cairo is where Loa Getzinger is buried. Buenos Aires is where Mac- May Maxwell is buried. Sydney is Hyde Dong. Tehran is Susan Moody. Esfahan is Ransom Keller. Tripoli is Ella Bailey. Depths of Mediterranean Sea is Dorothy Baker. These are number of believers who went out to serve and they died away from their homes. And Shoghi Effendi put them all together and gives us a picture of the gathering of these precious souls. Now, all of them, close friends, all of them, when I read the life of every one of them, they were all close friends. And they were all people who knew each other from young age, from the beginning that they had become a Baha'i. Although Dorothy Baker was younger than the others, but she was also raised by a grandmother who was in the same group of the Baha'is. They were all devotees of Abdul Baha. All of them had only one thing in mind, to serve Abdul Baha. It was really, to me, it's it's such a wonderful thing when we know of the lives of these believers. As there is time, I tell you a little bit about Susan Moody. This Susan Moody is so little is spoken of her outside Iran because her services was primarily in Iran. She was another very unusual human being. When she was very young, she always wanted to be a doctor. So quite young, she went to medical school, and the first time that she was in a dissection room, she fainted, and she decided this wasn't for her. She couldn't stand it. So she went and studied other things and did other works. She was 52 or 3 years old. When she wanted so much to be a doctor, she decided to go back to the medical school. And she became a doctor at the age of 60. Well, that's 60 today is much younger than 60 in 70 years ago. When she was, she became a Baha'i and she was a doctor and she had written to Abu Baha and she was a she had met Abdul Baha in the United States. Abdul Baha called her, wrote her a letter, and said, Very good, you are a doctor. There is a great need for a woman doctor in Iran. He invited her to come to the Holy Land to make a pilgrimage and go to Iran. Now, that is Iran of very early years of the, 19th, of the 20th century. I heard so much about this Dr. Moody from my mother and from my grandmother, although I never saw her, but it's a, she is a, a, a living, I think, as if I have known her and I have seen her. When she arrived, first of all, it took her three months to be able to travel to get to Tehran. It was so many problems that from the Holy Land, how she went to Baku, and Baku went, I don't know, to Tbilisi and from there, and eventually, by mules and by all kinds of unbelievable ways, she arrived in Tehran. There were no women doctor at that time in Iran, and women would not go to the doctors, to men doctors, and this was a big problem, and that's why Abu Baha wanted 
a Baha'i woman doctor to be in Tehran. She went and she opened after some months. Eventually she was able to, and they were about four Baha'i doctors, men at that time in the Tehran community. And they had planned. When Dr. Moody came, they thought it's a wonderful opportunity. They sat and talked together and planned to have a hospital, which would be uh, by them. And there was apparently amongst them one or two non-Baha'i doctors who wanted to join this group. But it took a long time before this dream was realized. And Dr. Moody decided not to wait and open her own clinic. Believe me, when you uh, hear the stories of what she saw in the clinic, in what condition her patients would come to her, and there's almost at the edge of death that they would agree to come and see her, she had no nurses. There were no nurses in Iran, in Tehran, to help her. How much difficulty she had to make women who were going to have for their childbirth not to have the old, very uh, unhygienic form of delivery that was common amongst the people. She wanted to train nurses. She couldn't find anybody who could be trained at that time. And it took her many years. This woman, in this condition, lived in Tehran for 17 years. By, at the end of 17 years, others came to her help. Another American doctor came to help her. A nurse came to help her. Amongst the Persians, she was able to educate girls gradually, to train them as nurses to help her. But she lived under such condition. And then, although she was serving the whole community, she wasn't a doctor just for Baha'is, because the women of Tehran, they all were in her, they needed her. And they would come to her. And her clinic was open to everybody. Nevertheless, she was also the target of fanaticism of people, that how many times that they had to come and smuggle her out in a veil out of her home because they were the mob were around and there was the danger of being killed. It was a very difficult period that she had. But, but not only she worked as a doctor, also she was there, she was one of the people, the builders of the girls' school in Tehran. There was a time when they had opened the girls' school and she had brought a young girl, 21-year-old girl, Miss Kappas, who came to be the principal of the Baha'i Girls' School and also the right hand of Dr. Moody all together. And she was nurtured by Dr. Moody and helped and together they were able to train, gradually educate the girls and bring them up to become more active in the society. After the war, one of the most terrible tragedies, this is the First World War, one of the greatest tragedies that happened in Tehran was this terrible attack of typhus. Uh, in Tehran, which killed tens of thousands of people were killed. One of them was Miss Kappas, a young woman, and she was only 29 years old when she died at that time. And this broke Dr. Moody's heart because she had taken her like a child of her own, a daughter of her own, and she lost her li life. She stayed there till 1930. 19, no, excuse, 1926. At that time, there was a, she became a very close friend of the American consul and a very close friend of, to her fr wife of the consul. And that there was a very terrible uh, period of uprise of Muslims, which was continuously going on. You know, every now and then they would have all kinds of 
uh, attacking the foreigners, the Christians, the Baha'is, and the Baha'is were always the scapegoat, no, no matter what, whatever political condition was in the country which caused trouble, it was the Baha'is who became the scapegoats and, and lost their lives. And an incident like that, this consul was killed. And uh, Dr. Moody eventually was sent. Abu uh, Shoghi Effendi had said that it was better for her to come out for a little while to things quiet down. She came out of Iran in 1926, went back to United States, and Shoghi Effendi told her that she should watch and go back whenever possible. And so she went back in 1930 to Iran, and she lived. She took with her another American woman who became also a legendary figure in the history of the face and was Adelaide Sharp. She was a young woman, and Dr. Moody found her at that time. Dr. Moody was pretty old, and she found Adelaide Sharp and brought her to Iran to become the principal of the girls' school in Tehran. Now, Adelaide Sharp was a wonderful friend of ours. She I knew very well <laughs> and was a mentor of Ali when he came to Iran. And she served for over 50 years in Iran. And she was uh, instrumental in educating uh, the women and the youth and so on. And Dr. Moody, Susan Moody, passed away in 1931. And she was buried in Tehran. So they were these really stars in the horizon of our history and our face who shone, who had the courage to get up alone, travel, come away from their own homes, and at the end lay their lives in these faraway lands. And I am so glad to remember them here. But from tomorrow, I'll come much closer to our time, still far from your ages, but at least our lifetime, and what we saw of heroism of people from around the world. No more just the Americans or the Persians, but the heroes who arose from the other continents, people who had just come into the face and what they did for this cause of the whole Thank you.